Um, so what I'm going to do in the next um, sort of 40 minutes or so is share with you my story, um, my story over the last eight years or so, talk a little bit about your world, the world of being at school, being young in, in 2020, and then talk more specifically about what my charity of I Can and I Am does. So um, my, my name, as I said, is James. I'm married. I have four children. Um, my eldest is now 19. He was 19 yesterday. It makes me feel very old. Um, so 19, uh, 16, 12, and 10, which is more your sort of world. And um, I uh, was a teacher for 16 years. And nine of those years, I was a housemaster um, of a, a boys' boarding house in a secondary school. Um, and back in 2012, so eight years ago now, I was appointed to become the headmaster of a prep school um, called Monkton Coombe on the edge of Bath. And that was great, folks. I was excited. I was going to be um, moving into a lovely home. Our kids could go through the school and all was good. Um, it was the first headship, age 39, that I'd applied for and, and got the job. I was then asked to go for a medical. And I've got to be honest with you guys, when I first heard that, I thought, wow, medicals, that's what sort of professional footballers do. And I thought, oh, I'm one of those now. So off I went for my medical. Um, lots of things were done and my eyes were tested and my left eye was found to be really not in very good shape. Um, so the doctor sent me off to an optician. Optician looked for the problem, couldn't see the problem. And then I was sent off to the big hospital in Bath, where I had something called an MRI scan, which is like a brain scan. And it was at that brain scan that an enormous great big brain tumour was uncovered. And uh, I remember the, the, the young kind of consultant that had been reading my scans just telling me I was a very, very poorly man. Now, folks, that was such a shock. I, I just did not see that coming. And, that was the start of what has undoubtedly been the sort of change in the journey of my life. So from there, I then went into hospital. I had two enormous operations, 27 hours of brain surgery. I spent 80 days in hospital, which is nearly three months, where I had a tracheostomy. I've got a horrible scar in my neck. That meant that I couldn't swallow. So eating, drinking, talking, three of my favorite things to do, in fact, I couldn't do. Um, I, um, but the biggest challenge came after my second surgery. And as I talked to you this morning, I am a registered blind man um, with no sight in my left eye and about 10% vision in my right eye. And that obviously meant that I couldn't take up the job of becoming a head teacher and not wanting your pity, guys, but if I compare you know, where I was at the end of the summer term in 2012 with where I was in 2013. They couldn't be more starkly different. So 2012, the job, the career, the house, the, everything was set fair. Yet in 2013, I found myself with four kids, but actually I didn't have a job. We didn't have a house. And added to that, I couldn't really see. Um, yes, on the other hand, I had four kids, I had a wife, and I was only 40 years old. So folks, lots and lots of challenges. You know, now I can't, I can't drive a car, I can't play any sport, I can't actually run, I've had two small strokes. So, you know, my, my disability is quite great. And, uh, you know, it was a real, real challenge um, that happened to me back then. And actually, in many ways, life still is a challenge. Um, with things that I can't do. Um, but, I, you know, I'm constantly walking into things and tripping over things and falling over and all that sort of stuff. But I spend a lot of time on trains now because I can't um, drive a car. Um, so when I travel off to places, I, I have to go on a train. And uh, it wasn't that long ago that I got onto a train and I sat down directly on a man's sandwich and uh, literally crushed this poor man's sandwiches into kind of pancakes and this man shouted at me for the whole carriage to hear are you 
effing blind, he shouted. And I held out my white stick and I said, yes, I am. So um, the whole carriage then found that very funny. It was like sort of Monty Python. This is good fun. So lots and lots of challenges. And I suppose what I want to kind of, you know, it, it talk about now is, is what happened next. Um, you know, having not been able to take up this job, coming out of my boarding house, not going into a headmaster's house. I moved or we moved as a family to a small house on the edge of Bath. And uh, that time, guys, was really, really tough. So, you know, so my four kids, my wife and I were in this house. And at that time, I would literally put on my dressing gown um, in the morning and I would bum shuffle down the stairs. I couldn't properly walk down the stairs. So I'd get to the bottom of the stairs. I'd grab hold of the back of a door or the back of a sort of sofa. And I would get myself to my white chair. And my white chair was where I would hang out for the day. I was 40 years old, but I was behaving more like someone that was 90 years old. You know, I couldn't properly, obviously couldn't see, um, but I couldn't really walk. And I would sit in my white chair and I would sort of fall in and out of sleep. And, and that, was, that was my life. That was who I was. It must have been so hard as I reflect on it for my wife to kind of, observe that's who she's married to but folks i remember a um, a guy used to come and see me and he used to play the role of a life coach and he used to say to me when he came to see me you know obviously how are you but then he would say james what's your passion and guys i think that was the most searingly brilliant question because although I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really do anything. But there, inside me, there was still a passion. And my passion, I remember saying to him, was to see young people like you guys in the upper school at Homewood House. You guys. I said, my passion is to see young people believing in who they are and what they can do. That's my passion. And I remember him just looking at me saying, great, let's do it. And there I was in my dressing gown, you know, and it was a part of a sort of evolving journey. You see, guys, as I think about school for you, like you guys, I went to a prep school. And I don't think when I was at prep school, there was anything like the academic pressure that you guys now have. As I think about prep schools, it's pre-tests into your senior schools and it's common entrance and it's assessments. And it's, I sometimes see education a bit like a funnel. If you can imagine a funnel, how it's kind of wide at the top. And when we start the journey, you know, maybe at pre-prep and the early years, you know, school's fun. It's full of activities and adventures and wonderful words like curiosity abound, but quite quickly, we start banging the academic drum, don't we? Quite quickly, it's the pretest, it's an assessment, it's, you know, it's, it's an interview, it's common entrance, then you move on and it's GCSEs and it's A-levels and it's your maths, your physics, your history, all that sort of stuff. So there's a pressure, if you can imagine, guys, there's a big pressure, let's say, on your left shoulder. Now, on your other shoulder, and this probably hasn't kicked in yet, I hope it hasn't, is the pressure of social media. Now guys, I have two teenage children and their mobile phones are quite important to them. Put simply, that is the place and the platform upon which young people, teenagers particularly, relate to each other. And I, you know, mobile phones and, and these amazing networks, they're brilliant. You know, with a click of a button, we can be in contact with someone in Australia. Yeah, great. But actually, can I tell you where I really battle with it? Is that those lovely and so important time-honoured kind of time-honoured traits of what it means to be a good friend, to be loyal, to be faithful, to be kind. Somehow social media is not like that. Social media is you put up a post or oh, aren't I looking buff or Oh, aren't they looking a bit weird? 
as well as that it's addictive that we get it what's called a dopamine rush when we get a message we need to be available on it 24 7 and one thing i really hate is that people often define themselves by how many likes how many people are following me and so there are two pressures guys on one shoulder there's the academic on the other shoulder is social media and what's that leading to well it's leading to more and more young people dropping their heads with a sense of i'm anxious i lost my sense of hope i'm a bit depressed and sometimes people even go as far as to say there's no point to my life anymore no guys that is just so wrong so so wrong and this is where my balloon is 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 central to all i say so i want you to picture folks that every single one of you sitting in homewood house this morning has a balloon within you and we want to see your balloons inflated because when they're inflated we bounce back that's the word resilience we bounce back inflated with a sense of i can and i am of value even though you might be battling with your work and failing tests and this and that we're still of value too many young people put simply are leaving school with a very deflated sense of who they are with a sense of kind of i can't and i'm no good i sometimes liken guys this rather sad deflated image to a deflated car tire and if you guys were to be picked up from school from homewood house maybe at, you know, at the end of today or a next yet or whenever and let's say you get into your parents cars and the front left tire of the car has got no air in it no air it's absolutely flat and you drive out of the drive and along the lanes and you go over and hit a curb let's say your parents drive through one or two potholes and they've got no air in the tire well what happens to the wheel rim the kind of rim of the actual wheel inside the car well it's not protected and of course it gets tainted it gets damaged but in the same way if we've got no air in our balloons and we fail a test we get dropped from a team we audition for a play we don't get a part we apply to become a prefect no you know if somebody's having a party you don't get invited but it's not the rim of the wheel guys that gets damaged it's us it's our sense of self it's our psyche it's it's who we are that is getting damaged so folks i've got really quite a simple question for us this morning and that is how do we see our I can and I am balloons inflated? How do we see these inflated with a sense of I can do it, I am of value, as opposed to that rather lamentable flat, I'm no good. So this is what I am going to talk about, guys. I've got four pillars four pillars like my fingers you can see there and these are the four pillars of how we inflate our balloons so pillar number one that we're going to start with is belonging belonging now guys belonging the word and feet i mean i don't need to define it but it is including every single person it is a found foundational fundamental human need that we belong is homewood house a school where every boy and every girl belongs cool uncool sporty not very sporty really good looking not so good looking very academically able academically less able let me tell you folks the world today is a truly diverse place 
absolutely where all sorts of runners and riders are kind of involved. I went to speak not that long ago before the lockdown at a big investment bank in London. Now, even with my failing eyes, I could see that there were different shapes and sizes, creeds and colors, lots of different types of people in the room. Now, that is, 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 is one world. The world today, you just have to sit on a train or a tube or, and you just realize, gosh, so diverse. And so should Homewood House be, where every individual is celebrated, where people genuinely are allowed to be themselves. The worst schools will say, oh, you've got to be like that. The best schools will say, no, everybody has got within them the kind of gold that makes them them. So one of the things I would love to do, guys, is to give you a challenge. Um, the year six, seven and eight at Homewood House, that you have a challenge and I want you to adopt this particular approach. Now you will expect your teachers, your head teacher, your Mr. Murray, you'll expect other members of staff, your parents to encourage you when something's gone well. But can we start to encourage us, uh, uh, each other? It's called mutual encouragement, where you as a pupil in year seven say, encourage somebody else in year seven. Now I'm sure it happens on the sports field, but does it happen in the chemistry lab? Does it happen in the dining hall, in dormitories, wherever you are? I always say to my own children, it costs you so little to encourage somebody, but the person who receives it benefits so much. So let's make it a challenge for ourselves. Each day, each day, each and every day, we try and encourage three people, not in a kind of stupid, silly way, but in an authentic, real way. I noticed, I was watching, I saw, I heard. And guys, I promise you, there is no more powerful way to inflate someone's balloon than to offer them encouragement. You see, folks, at the heart of it is this idea of working with, look at my hands, working with each other, which is called collaboration. Too often we are always in that posture, which is competition, which is against each other. Now, I always say, it's sports day, we're auditioning for a play, where, yes, of course, you compete and you do your best to win or to get what you're aiming for. But all the time, competitive is, is not cool. So may your year groups, year six, seven and eight, be year groups of collaboration, where we encourage one another, because that really helps in seeing a balloon inflated. So that is pillar number one. Pillar number two is that we have a growth mindset. Now guys, I'm sure you've come across the idea of a growth mindset. I'm sure that, you know, at school it is talked about and, and really what it's saying is instead of saying, I can't, we say, I can't do it yet. Now guys, I will put up my hand here and I will say, I am such a big fan of a growth mindset because guys it has changed my life as somebody who's got very little sight and has got disability what i now live my life by is a sense of small steps i can't do it yet let me tell you a story i remember when i came out of hospital in november so probably exactly about eight years ago maybe even to this day and I initially, when I came out of hospital, I went down to my mother's house. Um, we didn't really want our four children seeing their dad in such a weak, weak place. So I went down to my mum's house. And at that stage, guys, I really couldn't walk. I, I literally would get out of bed in the morning and I would crawl. I'd crawl to the top of the stairs, again, a bum shuffle down the stairs, 
and I would crawl through the hallway and I would get myself into my mum's kitchen. So my mum would see her 40 year old son, six feet two I am, crawling into the kitchen. That must have been quite harrowing for her. I would then get myself onto a sofa and I would sit there and I'd wait for Lindsay, the physio. And Lindsay would come along, she would hoist me up, and her job was to try and teach me to, to walk again. Like a baby, literally like a baby. Well done, James. You've done three steps today without falling over. Guys, that was just traumatic. And I remember once or twice crying, again, a bit like a baby, into my mum and just saying, Mum, I'm 40. I've got four kids. I want to become this head teacher. I can't even walk. And I remember mum very, very wisely just saying to me, it's about small steps. And folks, that's exactly what the growth mindset is. It's about small steps. Sometimes I feel with you guys today and this very digital world that we live in, we want to just, it's a big step and we get there and there's no effort, it's a no problem, darn easy. But you know, life is about small steps. And it's amazing when we take those small steps, what we can achieve. So folks, what I'm going to ask now is if we can just watch a, a clip of a lady who has got every reason to say, I can't but it's a very inspiring story. Let's watch this and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next pillar. Hello. Hi, how are you? And what's your name? Uh, Mandy Harvey. And who's this? My interpreter. What's your name? Sarah. Nice to meet you, Sarah. Nice to meet you, you, sir. Hi, Sarah. Doing well, thank you. Hello. Okay, Mandy, so I think I've worked this out. So you're deaf? Yes, I, I lost all my hearing when I was 18 years old. Wow, and how old are you now? Uh, 29, so it's 10 years. Wow. And Mandy, how did you lose your hearing, if you don't mind me asking? I have a connective tissue disorder, so basically I got sick and my nerves deteriorated. So, you were singing before you lost your hearing? Yeah, I've been singing since I was four. So I, I left music after I lost my hearing and then uh, figured out how to get back into singing with muscle memory, using visual tuners and trusting my pitch. So your shoes are off because you're feeling the vibration. Is that how you're following the music? Yeah, I'm feeling the tempo, the, the beat uh, through the floor. And Mandy, what are you gonna sing? I'm going to uh, sing a song that I wrote called Try. Okay, can you tell me what it's about? After I lost my hearing, I gave up. But I want to do more with my life than just give up. So. Thank you. Thank you. Good for you. Okay, well, look, this is your moment, and good luck. Uh, okay.
Andy, I don't think you're going to need a translator for this. I don't know, guys, how you find that, but I honestly think that every reason under the sun she has got to kind of say, I can't. But she picks up that little ukulele, sings, can't even hear herself, and wow, you know, produces that amazing song. And I don't know if you heard the lyric in the song where she said, the only thing that gets in my way is me. Now, guys, I know that I would not be sitting here talking to you today if I didn't have a growth mindset. And I think that that is what we need to have often. You know, it is a fear, a fear perhaps of what other people are going to think, a fear of, oh, it's not really worth it. But I promise you it works, firstly. And secondly, it makes a massive difference. So my challenge to you this morning, this afternoon, I think it is now, my challenge to you is that you actually adopt somewhere in your life. I don't know any of you as people. It may be a subject. It may be an activity, a sport. It may be a relationship with a teacher, a tutor, or a sibling, or another boy or girl within your year group. And instead of saying, I can't, full stop, bang, close the door, we say, I can't do it yet. And we take those small steps. And I suppose the job of the teachers is to notice and applaud those small steps. So there it is, folks. That is pillar number two. We have a growth mindset. And my challenge to you, maybe over the weekend, you think to yourself, where am I going to have that growth mindset? And the other thing that's important with a growth mindset is that you enter into what I'd describe as an accountable relationship. So a relationship with someone that, you know, that actually they can say, how are you getting on with it? And you can say, well, it's not been a good day or it's going well. So maybe that can be a parent or it maybe can be a tutor or a house parent or something like that, a matron. It doesn't matter who it's with, but as long as you are, you have a name and that actually there is somebody who can keep a check up and watch and you will make progress, folks. It's really exciting. And if you can learn at this stage of your of your school careers to have a growth mindset towards something and see that it works, I'm convinced that will be something that you can take forward in your lives and see and know that it really works. So number one is that there's a culture of belonging. Number two is that we have a growth mindset. The third of my four pillars has got two parts. And the first part is comes from a, a professor, a very, very clever man at Harvard University, probably the most academic seat of learning on the planet wrote a theory uh, many years ago so about 20 years ago now called the multiple intelligence theory now what he was saying and academics still the world over cannot deny it he was saying that every single person is clever so every single one of you listening now is clever but we're all clever in different ways. He came out with this quote, don't ask how intelligent is X, but ask how is 
x intelligent now guys that is basically saying a groundbreaking piece of news which i'd heard if i'd heard when i was your age i would thought no he's clever he's clever i'm average but actually the truth is that you are all clever in different spaces now there are two types of of um intelligence logical intelligence and being word smart or, or good with linguistics which is your english and your maths and your science but there are many other types of intelligence which actually are not assessed through common entrance or gcse's or a levels so one of the key things i think is that maybe over the course of the weekend or, or you know in your own time you look up those eight different intelligences it's sometimes it's a wagon wheel and you'll see you know so being good with people for example is a form of intelligence and yes it's of huge value at work but no there, it, it, you know there isn't a gcse in it is there so where are you intelligent and when folks we're in our place of intelligence air goes in our balloon we want air in our balloons because then we bounce back so we're all intelligent maybe you can have a look either on our website or on howard gardner's website and try and work out where you're intelligent maybe it's something that the teachers can do with you and work it out as well as being intelligent folks we all have a purpose a purpose is something that makes us us now for some um, and i know homewood house is strong on sport you know it might be sport it might be art it might be drama it might be singing music now they all get noticed at school and and get the sort of well dones and the plaudits but for some it may be quieter things of being caring being kind being very very good with animals being uh, as somebody who enjoys solving problems or making things or mending things or what is your purpose i always say to young people it's not playing computer games that's not your purpose it was ken robinson who has now died he said that we all have an element you look at my hands it's the joining point of what we love doing and what we're naturally good at and when those two come together it releases an energy, a charge that makes you feel more alive. So my third pillar is that we are all clever. Yes, we are, but in different spaces. Where's your space? And we all have a specific purpose. And my question is, what is your purpose? Maybe you can talk to people that know you well, speak to your your teachers, your, your, your tutors, your parents. Where's my purpose? What is it that I'm doing? Maybe it's something you can ask yourself as you lie in bed, as you think, as you dwell, you think, I'm at my happiest, you know, rigging a sailing boat, or I'm at my happiest, you know, repairing a, a fence that's blown down, or I'm at my happiest cooking a meal. And guys, again, when we're doing that, that's when air goes in our balloon. So there it is, there's pillar number three, that we're intelligent and we have a purpose, which moves me on to the fourth and final pillar. And that is that we all, every single one of us listening now, we all have a real hope. Hope is a sense that something good is gonna one day happen in our lives. And folks, often I spend a bit of time mentoring, quite a lot of time mentoring, and often when I speak to people, one of the things that really holds them back is they may well have had a setback. A setback, something that is holding them back. And actually, I have a real view on setbacks, that setbacks aren't things that break us and define us. They're things that we should refine ourselves through. What I mean by that is make ourselves better. So when something goes wrong, we fail a test or we get dropped from a team or we audition for a part in the plane, we don't get it. Or instead of saying, oh, I'm useless, 
we actually say, okay, why did that happen? What can I learn from that? The term I use is that we reflect and refine when a setback happens. We don't dwell on it and then define ourselves. So Mike goes, oh, I'm a blind man. Oh. No, don't do that. We guys, we get one life, one go at this thing called life. And we want to make the very most of it. So when we've had a setback, it becomes instead of a quiver or an arrow that goes through our heart, it's an arrow that we can pull out and we can put in our quiver and actually we move forward and we're stronger for it. When you kind of read of really successful people all the time, they've had setbacks and challenges, but they've used them to their advantage. They've learned from them. And when we've moved on from our setback, that is the point where we can dream a dream. Whenever I meet any of my children's friends, I'll always say, what would you one day love to do? And often I'll hear them say, well, I need to get this. I need to pass that. I need to get those grades. I said, you know what? You're not an academic robot. You're a human being with potential. What is your dream? And they might say, well, I'd love to dive to the bottom of the ocean. I'll say, well, how are you going to do that? And they'll say, I don't know. I said, one of the key things you need in life and something that can't be taken out of you is your attitude. Now, we're going to conclude now by watching another short film of an Australian man who's got no arms and no legs. But what he's got is an incredible, incredible attitude. Let's watch this and then I'll wrap up. I wasn't ready. I have no arms and no legs, but I'm very thankful that I have my little chicken drumstick here. <laughs> People freak out when they see me for the first time. It's so cool, I was at a water slide um, all by myself. Everyone obviously at the bottom of the slide is looking up and waiting for other people to come down and here I come and they're freaking out. They're like, you know, like this. And I was so tempted to look at myself and go, what happened? You know? And there were times where I sort of looked at my life and thinking, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And you keep on concentrating on the things that you wish you had or the things that you wish you didn't have and you sort of forget what you do have. And there's no point, I believe, in my life where I wish I had arms and legs, I wish I had arms and legs, I wish I had arms and legs, because wishing won't help. But what I've seen in life are just a couple key principles, and the first thing that I've seen is to be thankful. It's hard to be thankful, man. I tell you, when I was eight years old, I, I sort of summed up my life and thought, I'm never going to get married, I'm, you know, I'm not going to have a job, I'm not going to have a life of purpose. What kind of a husband am, am I going to be? I can't even hold my wife's hand. It's a lie to think that you're not good enough. It's a lie to think that you're not worth anything. One point. Woo! It's freezing. I can't feel my hand. <laughs> I love life. You know, so many people come and say, how come you smile so much? And I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> but it's very simple at the same time. You see, it's very hard to smile sometimes in life. There are things that happen that you don't know and you don't understand and you don't know if you're going to get through it. You know, you go through your storms in life and you don't know how long this storm is going to be. And today I want to share with you some principles that I've learned in my life that you can use in yours. Being patient is beautiful. I, I tell you, it's the hardest thing. But I realize I may not have hands to hold my wife's hand, but when the time comes, I'll be able to hold her heart. I don't need hands to hold her heart. You know, it is scary to know how many girls 
have eating disorders. It is scary to know how many people are just angry at life because of their situation at home and anger at others. It's scary to know how many people actually feel like they're worth nothing. Every single girl right here, right now, I want you to know that you are beautiful. You are gorgeous just the way you are. And you boys, you're the man. What that guy has, um, folks, is an incredible attitude. You know, let's be honest, an unimaginable life, you know, with no arms, no legs. You know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine, but what he's got is a great attitude, which makes me think again, like the deaf lady, you think to yourself, why can't we do that? And actually, like I said earlier, your attitude is something that can't be taken out of you. And that a kind of can do, I'm going to keep going and remain determined is so, so important. And the thing that he's taught me um, over the last eight years is learning to be thankful, to be thankful for what you do have and what you can do. And that's right at the heart of it, isn't it? And let's be honest, you, you know, you're, you're at a really good prep school, you've got food, you've You've got homes, you've got people that love you, you've got so much to be thankful for. And I think a better place is to sit in a place of I'm thankful I do have. So those two pressures, social media and academics, are leading to more and more young people dropping their heads. But my, my plan for you all guys is that you have inflated balloons if I can and I am. How do we keep them inflated? Well firstly we make sure that Homewood House is a place where everybody belongs. Sporty, unsporty, cool, uncool, doesn't matter. We've all got gold somewhere within us. We have a growth mindset. We don't say I can't. We say I can't do it yet and so much of life is about those small steps. Number three, we're all clever. Where are we clever? We have a purpose. What is our purpose? Talk to people, research, look on the internet at the wagon wheel of intelligences. Again, when we're in that place, air goes in our balloon. And then the fourth and final posture is to remember that we have a real hope. And when we have a setback, we reflect and we refine ourselves from it and we move forward and we dream a dream and what will affect where we end up in life is the attitude that we have. Not the academic results, but the attitude that we have. So folks, I want to conclude this talk by saying to you all, every single one of you in year six, seven and eight, walk tall with the truth that you can and you are of value. Thank you very much. Brilliant, James, thank you uh, very, very much. Um, uh, typically we've got everybody on mute, but there is lots of applause and lots of movement yeah. going on all around. So uh, thank you very much. Um, as always, an absolutely brilliant message. Um, and the the sense of belonging sense of community completely 100 percent agree with it. and it's so lovely that your message echoes uh the three uh, aims and ethoses of of homewood of aspiration self-belief and kindness so uh thank you very much um we do have quite a few questions whilst the talk's been going on there's been some questions popping up from the year groups if you're happy to yeah to field of course, of those. Of course, yeah um, and they start, uh, so the, the first one is, what were your favourite subjects at school? Uh, <laughs> well, I ended up teaching geography. Um, I loved geography. I enjoyed history. Um, and um, yeah, I think those would be my two favourites. I wasn't very good at science. Um, I enjoyed English, but I think I was only ever average at English, but probably geography and history were my two favourites. And sport. I love sport. Brilliant, brilliant, and golf in particular, I yeah, think, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, and then, then moving a bit deeper now, um, how do you overcome the feeling of not uh, being able to do the things that you love? I know. I, I'm not going to lie, guys. You know, sometimes it's very challenging, you know. And I, I'll tell you, one of the things I find hardest is that often if I go and watch any of my children, you know, you always feel as a, as a dad, you have a divine right to watch them do something you love, maybe a, 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 a rugby match or a cricket match or something, and you turn up and you can't really see them. Um, I find that really, really hard. Um, and I suppose with, with, with the rest of it, it's a kind of what you would describe as an ongoing journey. And, you know, I'm getting used to a, a very different life now. I wouldn't say I'm 100% there, um, but I'm getting more uh, akin to what I suppose I'd describe as my new normal. Thank you. Um, and then we've got another one from uh, year seven. Um, do, people, do you find that people treat you differently? Um, and if so, how does that make you feel? I suppose there's pros and cons yeah. as well. Yeah, I, I, I think as a generic line, I would say the British public, when you wander around with a white stick, um, which I do, and honestly, 99 times out of 100, are, are, are very, very kind, are very decent. And once or twice I've had problems where I've fallen down flights of stairs or I've, you know, I've walked into something, my glasses have fallen off my face and people are always there to help me. Um, getting onto a train, often people will wait and let me on first. Um, I've had one or two difficult times, um, the London Underground, <laughs> Russia, but if I'm honest with you, that's, you know, it's a challenge for anybody, isn't it? But it's, you know, certainly a huge challenge when you can't see. Um, but no, I wouldn't do that again. And I think sometimes you just got to learn what you really can and can't do. I think then we're well, leading on from that. I've almost answered it there. What do you think has helped you most through, through the hard times? I think going back to, um, Nick Vujicic, that little Aussie fellow, I think learning to try and be thankful um, for what you can do and do have. You know, I, I, if I was speaking to you in person, I would have shared this story, but I, I, I'll just share it really quickly. I've still got 50% of my tumour in my, in my brain still. And um, once a year, I have to go back to have an MRI scan to check on, is the tumour growing? Does anything more need to be done? And it was three years ago, I went back to the hospital in Bristol where I was operated on, and I bumped into my surgeon. Now, you don't really see surgeons knocking around, but there he was. And he remembered me quite surprisingly. He said, hello, James, how are you? And I said, I'm okay. He said, did you take that job as, as head teacher? I said, no. And I suppose at that point, I fell into that lethal little spot of self-pity, feeling a bit of a victim of, oh, poor old me. And I'll never forget, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said this to me. He said, James, I want you to know something. He said, I was that far from deeming you to be inoperable, that far. He said, you had so much tumour around your brainstem he said, I couldn't see any way of operating on you when I looked at the scans of leaving you paralysed. That was the only outcome I could see. So today, to see you able to walk, able to talk, is a miracle, James. Now, I've got to learn to be thankful for that. No, I can't see. No, I can't run. No, I can't. I, can't. I mean, my can'ts is a very long line, but I have got one or two things to be thankful for. And we all have guys. That is the bottom line. Complete, yeah, completely agree. Um, and and uh, a little bit more revel uh, uh, relevant now, um, and I think we're seeing this now, having, as you've said there, not being in school and doing it remotely. Um, have things changed and have you had to adapt how you do things in light of the pandemic and the, go the current going on? Yeah, if I'm really honest with you, I. Um, I find the lockdown quite a challenge because, because obviously I can't drive. 
um, a lockdown really does mean that I'm at home, you know, full time. You know, I don't get in the car and drive off to a, you know, even a supermarket. I'm just kind of here. Um, and actually, you can sometimes think to yourself, oh, my word, I've not left home for two and a half weeks, you know. Um, and you do get an element of kind of locked in syndrome or, or kind of, you know, cabin fever. Um, but, you know, it, it's amazing, these Zoom links, that you can keep doing what you do, and, and, but you don't connect in the same way. I, I would love to be with you all this morning. Um, and it is different doing it from afar, but, you know, it's better than nothing, I suppose. Brilliant. And then we, we've got a, a couple more of, um, so on a, on, a, on a daily basis, you know, what, what makes you smile? regularly and uh what would you say what are you most proud of um in your work well, your career and life for uh, that's from year seven yeah i suppose i i, I could do better at smiling I, i'm not gonna lie i could do better at smiling i think smiling is you know they always say actually when you smile you release hormones that make you feel a bit more happy and joyful um i um, I, you know, I, I sometimes think back and I just think, wow, it could have been different. I, 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 um, Winston Churchill said that when we have difficult times, we have that choice of we can either give up or we can get up. And I genuinely feel like I have got up, um, you know, and my children give me a lot of joy. Um, and I think trying to do things for other people um, seems to be very important and is a way of making me feel happy of, of you know, putting other people before myself. Um, yeah, so, so yes, I think that would be, would be the thing. But what makes me smile? I think the sunshine. Uh, we have a lovely dog. Um, that makes me smile. Um, and, and I suppose sitting, talking to people. Brilliant. Um, James, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it is, as always, uh, completely inspirational. So thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, on behalf of everyone at Homewood, um, thank you very much for your time and for your message. And hopefully when, the, uh, when all of this lifts, we will be able to uh, get you down to our, to our wonderful school. And I'd love to come and see you all. I would really love that. So um, thank you very much for listening, guys. And is it fish and chip time? It probably is, isn't it? Is it? It's a Friday. It's got to be fish and chips. It's a Friday. Come on. Enjoy them. And uh, thank you very much.